Marisa Mora from Spanish and Portuguese. As, again, she'll be talking on Afro-Latinidad. Okay. Welcome everybody. I'm very glad to see everyone here and see a lot of my own students here in the room. It makes me very excited. Um, of course, we all know that there are extra incentives to those kinds of right, presences. But um, Well, uh, today I was invited to be part of the Marienda Fall Lecture Series. And as we know, um, this is not going to be a typical lecture talk where I talk for a half hour or 40 minutes and then you ask me a bunch of questions. This is actually going to be a very interactive uh, talk where we'll have a discussion and do a little bit of workshopping in terms of our ideas. Um, so and also what we can do right and how we can think more deeply about some of these things. So I want to get started <clears throat> um, and one I named my presentation my presentation repping la patria question mark Afro Latinidad and representation in US media and culture right because if you understand what patria is right patria is your home country your homeland right this idea of nation and belonging or representing right your nation or being represented right within your nation as well so let's get to it so Afro who I get that a lot when I talk about Afro Latinos and they're like Afro who what um, so let's see let's talk a little bit about, don't cheat and don't look at the definition just yet <laughs> right this is just a definition this is not the definition so I will highlight that what do we know about Afro Latinos you can say nothing you can say I'm not sure or you can give me an idea <laughs> of what you believe that could mean or what the identity entails we have a couple of students who've been to DR before <coughs> Afro Latinos. Who are Afro Latinos? Okay, let's. Yes. Um, people living in the United States that have um, descent from that have either migrated to the United States um, from Latin American countries and that uh, identify can identify as Latino or Black in the United States. Okay, I saw another hand back here. Oh, I think. I was Colin, was that you? Thing. Were you gonna say something? Well, they're, and they also live in Latin America? Yes, that could be Afro Latin Americans, right? Oh, just kidding. If we want to be more specific, right? That would be a more specific to the region. Anyone else? Can we get more specific? Yes, Samia? Africans that were brought over like several centuries ago, probably as slaves, to Latin America, and then they had intermixed with the natives and probably like people. Okay. Okay, okay, good. Anybody else wants to add to that? The yes. The diasporic history of uh, like African descent within Latino America coming into the United States. Yes, that is one good way to put it, <laughs> along with everyone else. Okay. So yes, one way to put it, colloquially speaking, when we can say <clears throat> Latinos who identify as racially black, that's one way to put it. Um, also, in the Afro-Latino Reader, which is a edited volume by Miriam Jimenez Roman and Juan Flores, this is the definition that they use, right, as part of that very um, important and canonical book. Uh, they are, it says, and I quote, they are people of African descent in Mexico, Central and South America, and the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, and by extension, those of African descent in the United States whose origins are in Latin America and the Caribbean. Caribbean, right? It's interesting because even though this is a pretty um, solid definition, I think, or one one way, right, to think about Afro-Latinidad, one of the things that I was talking to to one of my scholar friends, and he says, well, yeah, I think that that definition can help us a bit, but I think one of the things that we have to be careful with with these definitions is that, you know, are we shaping them in terms of linguistics or region, right? Because someone might interpret that this particular definition, right, even though it says South America, the part that we add Spanish-speaking Caribbean, well, then does, does that mean only Spanish-speaking South America, right? Because then that would leave out Brazil and Guyana and Suriname, right? It would, it would leave out quite a few Belize. places. Um, yes, Belize, right? And we have other places here. And then if we talk about the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, well, can you really divide Dominican Republic from Haiti when they're both on the same island? Do, can we consider Haitians, Afro-Latinos as well? Right, so 
I present this, this definition here as a definition, but not as the definition, right? There can be many ways to describe Afro-Latinos. Some people might include these other places in the definition, and some might not, right? So that can be one of the, this is one of the ways, right, that we can start to think about who Afro-Latinos are, right? In but the we can. In the Arroba, I mean, the act, when you, sometimes you do Afro-Latina with the Arroba. Yeah, we'll go into that in a second. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's actually interesting, because here for the Afro-Latino reader, which comes out in the mid two thousand, mid, uh, middle of the early 2000s, not early 2000s, but, um, they use the arroba, right, the at, and then here I use the x. At this point, we, they weren't using the x yet, right? He, this was a way of including o and a, right, so women and men, but also some people might say that this is also kind of gender fluid, but we've started to use the x to be inclusive of all genders, including non-binary genders as well. Can you pronounce it with the vowel? Yeah, I mean, you can say, Afro, some people just say Afro-Latinos, Afro-Latinas, Afro-Latinx. Some, pe Latinx. some people say Afro-Latinx, but some people don't like the way that Afro-Latinx sounds, so they still do Afro-Latinos, but when they write it, they still write it this way. Okay. Now, when we talk about, today we're talking about, in particular, about media and representation, right? Because that's one of the most ways that we become visible, right? So I think that when we talk about Afro-Latino representation, the question is, well, who gets to represent Latinidad? And who gets to represent blackness? And what does that particular blackness in the U.S. look like? And what does that particular Latinidad look like? So let's break this question down and talk about it a little bit in terms of who gets to represent Latinidad. Yes. Usually light-skinned Hispanics like Sofia Vergara. Mm -hmm. And, well, black, like Afro-Latinos, very rarely get represented because we don't think of um, Afro-Latinos as Latino. Yeah. What else? Yes, in the back. They're also looking for like, the same kind of stereotypes, of stereotypes of, like, oh, if they move with their hands, if they <laughs> dance, or if they talk loud, that's the kind of, they're referring to, oh, that's a Latino, that's how they act. Mm -hmm. There's no other way. Right, so there are very limited notions of how we see even Latinidad represented in the U.S. media. And when I say U.S. media, I'm also including U.S. Latino media, right? Like Univision, Telemundo, um, right? These things are also represented in the U.S. How about in terms of blackness? How is blackness represented in U.S. media, just generally speaking? Or who gets to rep like what? What are the right? What does a black? What is blackness according to U.S. media? Yes. I feel like in the United States, especially, blackness is is seen as synonymous with African American, and that people try people almost only associate those two and don't even consider other people who are black. Mm hmm Yes. Uh, I think sports culture has a huge part in that because it's that's often how U.S. media portrays black individuals. Yeah, definitely, right? And so when we say who gets to represent Latinidad or particular to what is Latinidad and what is blackness, um, what is very important, and we're going to talk about it in a little bit, is what is behind these I particular identities that we don't see a lot of Afro-Latino representation. So how is it represented is one thing that we're going to go into, right? Or Right, we talked a little bit about how Latinidad is represented and how blackness is represented. But can anybody identify any of the people here? Celia okay, so we have Celia Cruz here, and who is this? Was. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> His name's Laz something. Laz Alonzo, yes. And can anybody identify this person? If you watch Love and Hip Hop, Love and Hip Hop Miami is about to come out. She's about to be one of the new people that's coming up on Love and Hip Hop Miami. Okay, I'll go, I'll come back. And who is this? That's right. Anybody know her, her real person name? That is, yes, that is Ashley from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, also known as Tatiana Ali. So Celia Cruz is Cuban, rest in peace. Laz Alonso is also Cuban. This is Amara La Negra. So if you watch Love and Hip Hop Miami or are planning on to, she will be there. Amara La Negra is Dominican from Miami. And this is Tatiana Ali, who's Panamanian and Trinidadian. Okay, so, so a lot of times, I think Celia Cruz, you know, it has been pretty represented that people know who she is, but I want to point out that there are a lot of other Afro-Latinos in media that sometimes we don't even know are Afro-Latino. Like Laz Alonso, I did not know Laz Alonso was Cuban. 
and had a crush on him forever. Um, <laughs> as well as Tatiana Ali, I did not know that she was Panamanian and Trinidadian. And I was like, oh, wow. Um, and she talks about it. So here I have a video, and we're going to skip over a few of the narratives to see how Afro Latinidad has been or really hasn't been represented, especially with artists and actors who are Afro-Latinos and their experiences and what it has meant to not be or in, uh, represented or to feel invisible even though they're literally right in front of the camera, right? That's, mm, am I not getting, that's okay, we can all see it. I remember when I was a kid, like being called a couple names and I had an accent because Spanish was my first language. And I came home to my parents one day and I was like, Mom, well, what am I? I don't know. The kids, everyone's asking me what I am. And I remember this is literally, I'm like five or six years old. They said, Well, Christine, you're Cuban and you're brown. I remember my mom really trying to have us be bilingual. This is at a young age, kind of having these words. And, you know, my mom only trying to only speak to us in Spanish, and me in particular, he's saying, this is America. I'm going to speak English. We spoke Spanish at home. If you want to get fed, <laughs> if you want to get dressed, if you wanted somebody's attention, you spoke Spanish. It was my first language. We grew up, you know, speaking English and Spanish, at, you know, at home. Uh, you know, predominantly Spanish, especially with my father, who's English was, was not uh, the, the greatest, but we were a Hispanic household, you know. Growing up, it was very clear to me that my ethnicity was Puerto Rican and Cuban. But in terms of color, my family is very mixed. We have, you know, white people with blonde hair and blue eyes, and we have, you know, black people as well. I learned Spanish before I learned English. You know, I learned Spanish in the home because my grandmother spoke no English. My grandfather spoke no English. My parents were very clear about, you know, my mother used to say all the time, you know, don't let anybody tell you you're not black and you're not Latina. I mean, sometimes I always felt like we were black people that spoke Spanish. I think sometimes with some of my friends that were lighter skinned Latinos, they might have tried to blend into the white world. Some of us that were darker skinned, we had no choice. When you look on the screen or in a magazine or wherever media you might um, take in, there's definitely going to be an impression left on you. There's no one dark skinned. Everybody's pretty, light skinned, and skinny. I only see white people, white Hispanics. I normally don't see darker skinned Hispanics. I don't know, I just found that a little racist. When I became an actress, I, I, I quickly realized that uh, the world um, liked their Latinas to look Italian, not like me. And so I wasn't going up for Latina parts. I was going up for African-American parts. I would um, get really um, positive reactions at auditions for both African-American and Latino parts. But I didn't look Latino enough because of the curly hair and the freckles and the, the nose and all that stuff. It bothered me. Of course it bothered me because what I look like and what I am, it doesn't change that I'm a Latina. And you're telling me that I'm too dark? My agent was saying, okay, we're having trouble. They looked at her picture, and we send her out for Latina roles, but they're looking more for fair skin or Mexican. I ended up booking more African-American roles. I still, to this day, have trouble booking a lot of Latina roles, um, just because, you know, I'm a brown Latina. I identify with my culture, you know, more so than a lot of the guys that I've lost roles to, but I just don't look as Latin as they do. You know, it was frustrating for me at the time um, auditioning because I would go into a room and, you know, based on color, sometimes they felt that I looked black. And have somebody that didn't know anything about my culture telling me what Latino was. And I was like, all right, cool. How do, how do we speak again? Oh, okay, cool. I didn't know. So I'm not dressed like a Latino? Okay, how should I dress? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I opened my shirt a little more? Cool. I mean, what do you want me to do? You want me to salsa while I speak? They would be like, yeah, more like that. <laughs> more like that. Maybe, you know, you just gotta be bigger with your moves. You're like, more exaggerated. I'm like, oh, okay. Damn, I didn't know how to be Latino. Thank you for explaining that to me. <laughs> Regardless of, of the fact that I spoke the language better and understood the culture better, uh, those weren't the parts that I could take seriously. And suddenly you have to explain why I look how I look. And then it gets complicated, and nobody wants complicated. There's places where I know there is. All right, I'm going to pause it there. 
Uh, reactions, questions about the video, or things that you didn't know that you're like, oh, I didn't know that, and now I know. Yes. Uh, it just seemed like all of them were just very, that fit. They, they were in no way that they, just because they didn't look the way that they are supposed to from, from their, from their um, origin or their country, that they were losing um, opportunities just because they didn't look like they were supposed to. Mm. Yeah, but they just seemed very annoyed and kind of, I guess, angered by it. Mm hmm Right? Kind of angry that they're not, right? They don't look how they're supposed to, right? This for like you don't look like that. Well, you don't look right. What I believe you're supposed to look like. Yeah. What else? Not only really that, but like I'm trying to tell them how to act like a Latino. That's the part that enrages me because it's like, who are you to tell them that they are Latino? Right. This idea of telling you how to act or how to perform. Right. What you're supposed to act like so that I can read you and think. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're definitely Latino. Right. right. Yes. Um, it was a, like leading them to question their identity at such a young age when they weren't originally. Yes, what else? I just want to also add that the accent sometimes, you know, is part of the cultural thing that Americans, they don't know how to differentiate and then they just mm -hmm. call you, you are Latino or you're from Mexico or you are from Italy because you're features. Right, or you have an accent, right? But they don't have an accent, so then they're like, right? It doesn't fulfill what they think, right? A Latino is supposed to even talk like, right? I think it's just really interesting, like, seeing the behind the scenes of how stereotypes get perpetuated even through movie casting. Like, mm -hmm. just, yeah. yeah, hand over here. No, no. <laughs> Sonia. I have a question. So, since they don't get those roles that, like, are the stereotype of Latinos in America, uh, if we go to, like, some place in Latin America, do darker skinned people actually get those, get cast in those mm -hmm. roles, or is it always get into lighter? That is a great question, and the answer is no, they do not. And we're going to be talking a little bit about, right, what does that look like in Latin America in just a little bit. Yes? It's, it's just kind of ironic that it's, the cycle continues itself because people like in pa positions of power in media are like, oh, we got to cast what people understand, and people can expand what they understand without a, like exposing themselves like, oh, okay, there are Afro-Latino people. Cool, I didn't know that. Now I know. Right. So, like, you can't show them because they won't get cast. Right. So it's almost like you're implicitly suggesting that even though media casts something that is what is understandable as, of in the mainstream, right, media also has the power to kind of shift, right, and expand our notions of, well, this is what it also is, right? So the media does have that power to kind of expand our understandings. Yes, in the back. So in the reader, it kind of talked about Du Bois having like the double consciousness idea and how like the added triple consciousness, but they don't even talk about gender in that. And I think that would be like an added layer, especially in film and that kind of stuff with the <laughs> discrimination. And Yes, so gender is a big thing, and no, they don't talk about it in the intro, they do talk, have a section on Afro-Latinas, but I will be going into that in a little bit at the end of the, com at the, end of the conversation, and we are going to talk about Afro-Latinas, because that is specifically what I do, um, but yes, exactly, pointing at that gap of like, are we going to also talk about gender? Yes, last one here. Something I didn't think about when we watched this the first time is that like, it must be important enough to the plot of whatever they're writing, like that this person like looks a certain way, which is interesting because like it probably shouldn't even matter like what like the racial or like ethnic background of someone is if like you have a plot to your show. Or, like, right. Maybe, right? Because if we're casting a light skin, what we mainstreamly think of what Latino looks like, right? And we cast, let's say we go and we cast someone like Amara La Negra, then the story right might leave out some things about how she looks right because for a lot of afro latinos right and a lot of the things that we see in the video their race right and how they're red being black has a lot to do with way with your experiences yes and i feel like um how what the woman said was that um i mean nobody wants complicated and so once you get the race part going and it's like well they're not white latinas therefore we're, we're confused Therefore, we're not going to pay attention to a movie, so they want as simple as possible. Mm, right. Sim simplistically be able to just identify, right, and be able to connect, right? Nobody likes complicated, right? So here's the thing. There has started in some ways, right, some shape or form, there has been some representation of Afro-Latinos, and I want to point out some of these here. I don't know, but... Here's the thing, a lot of these narratives have become very limited even in their representations. So when we talk about repping Afro-Latinidad or representing Afro-Latinidad, I don't know if anybody watches this. 
Does anybody know what this is? Oh, okay. Well, there's this show on HBO that's very popular Insecure? called Insecure. Um, interesting thing, in this season of Insecure, right, this is Molly, who's the best friend of the protagonist, Issa Rae, and this is Dro, who comes in on second season and is a old high school friend of Molly's. Dro, his character is Afro-Latino. His dad is Cuban, and his mom is possibly also Cuban or African-American, and he is black. He is Afro-Latino. However, in the show, we don't know more about his story in terms of his experiences as an Afro-Latino, in terms of what the story is. We just know his romantic involvements with Molly. We don't know anything else. Now, here, this is a movie from 2011 called Colombiana with Zoe Saldana, who is Dominican and Puerto Rican. Now, Colombiana is a story of when she was, right, the character here is an adult, but as a child, um, some criminal people murdered her parents, right? However, in the movie, it's about revenging her parents' death, but again, we don't really see too much about her story besides her parents getting murdered and how terrible that was, right, and kind of how tough she is, but we don't see anything else, right? It's a very limited story. Now, does anybody recognize this film? Moonlight. Moonlight was probably one of the most Afro-diasporic films I have seen in my lifetime, right, being that does everybody remember his name? Chiron, right? Being that Chiron's mother is Haitian, right? And Juan here is Cuban. What else do we learn about Juan besides that he's Cuban and he's not even in the film very long, right? And that he kind of inspires Chiron to kind of start to fit into his own, right? Embrace his identity and who he is. What else do we know about Juan? Right, exactly, crickets, nothing, right? We know nothing else about Juan's story, right? So we have started kind of even just having these small kind of teeny tiny drops in US media of Afro-Latino representations of our stories or, you know, us actually being in the story, but there is nothing much to the narrative, right? Which is the problem, right? Again, as Gina Perez said, nobody likes complicated. Let's keep it simple kind of things, um, however, the question is, well, why? Why do you think, why else? Like, what is, let's go deeper and think about why our Afro-Latino, our Afro-Latino narratives, right? And I say narratives, and let me clarify what I mean by that, because, right, we can have, for example, if we go back, Molly, this character is African-American, but Molly herself, the actress, is actually Nigerian. Right? So we have a lot of Nigerian actors and actors who are, who are black but not necessarily African American who represent African American roles, right, to tell that particular story. So why don't we, right, and we have uh, Mahershala Ali here who plays, right, Juan, an Afro-Cuban, but then again, the narrative is limited. So the question is why don't we have enough representations of the narrative, why don't we have more, right, we do have Afro-Latinos on screen as we see in that video, but they're not playing Afro-Latino parts, right, they're playing African-American parts, right, so why do you guys think that is? What's at the, at the late, at the foundation of this? I feel mean? like kind of what we discussed that there's a stereotype that this is what the Latin person should look like, so I feel like if they casted someone who looked different, it would, it may, like, they may think that it would be harder for the audience to accept that person in that particular role. Okay. Maybe because it's kind of against the stereotype and because the stereotype is so strongly embedded in our heads. True, but why don't we just have, we, we can say, oh, we want to have an Afro-Latino character. Like, we want to represent that story. Why aren't we representing the story? Besides that they don't fit, fit the particular stereotype. But let's say they're not playing, they're not getting casted to play those roles. Uh, Gabrielle. I think it goes back to what is black in the U.S. and the stereotype of who is black. So it's African American and they are thinking like, okay, only the only black people in the U.S. are African American, so we can't portray anything else. Or it, does there exist anything else to portray? Like, they don't know that there are other people that can connect with these other, you know, Afro-Latinos and things like that. They just think, oh, black, U.S., African-American, that's all that exists. Yes. What else? But why? It's like, well, then why can't we have other, let's say, why can't we have the story of, right, we have Chiron's mom and we have Chiron, why can't we have more about their story about who they are as Haitians living in Miami? Amelia? 
I think it goes, I mean, with what Gabby was saying with, like, um, the African Americans versus, like, the others. So we understand African Americans and, like, others from outside of the U.S. We don't understand and we don't even really try to understand, um, <laughs> which I think, I mean, is just us playing into stereotypes and, like, we don't bother to look for. And also it might be, like, a power struggle of, like, um, dominant, like, in the U.S. versus, mm -hmm. like... Um, non-dominant outside of the U.S. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna pick up there. I feel like it all comes back to like visual cues because people like to. Uh, I, I feel like there's a there's like a term in psychology of like just keeping the cue simple to like what you associate in your mind, and then that's what people just try and like keep focused that like their the visual cues of what they're seeing match what they're expecting in their mind. That could be part of it. Yeah, I think it's. Interesting to note, like, we think visual cues, but that doesn't quite apply to white actors, per se. So, like, you have movies set in Africa, and the whole cast is white, and we're like, oh, that's fine. <laughs> but, it's like, the reverse of any other culture, and we're like, what's going on here, you know? Right. And I, I like that you mentioned that because one of the ways, here's one way to think about it, I'm st and I'm still trying to think through these ideas, right, but bear with me here, right? So when we talk about, particularly in the U.S., right, why is it that that is okay maybe outside of the U.S. and they do it and it's like no one really questions it? But the moment that any of this would happen here, someone's going to start drawing questions. I mean, there were big questions about Soy Saldana playing Nina Simone, right? Um, but here, right, well, when we think about blackness in the United States, we think about it as African-American, right? It's non-immigrant, meaning it is not in any kind of way, shape, or form foreign. There is no accents associated with this, right? We have, right, black Hollywood is a big, right, moneymaker. And black Hollywood means it is this, it is not anything else, right? Black Lives Matter is great. But Black Lives Matter has not, in terms of mainstream, right, nobody, asso nobody associates Black Lives Matter with anything that's not African American, even though even some of the participants and members of Black Lives Matter and even founding Black Lives Matter are not just African American, right? Um, so it's not foreign, right? But it's also, if we were to think about these two identities within US media culture, blackness has to be this and whiteness has to be this you know, or, or Latina, Latinidad, excuse me, has to be this. But then whiteness, almost in the United States, white American identity almost frames these two things to stay, right, in these kind of very stereotypical ways that we can understand them, right? So, like, why is it going back to your point that in other places, right, let's say if you were to watch a South African movie, you probably see a lot of white characters in there, and you're like, wait, there's, there's more than, like, South Africa is very diverse, right? So here, one of the things that we can think about is, like, what, is, what happens when Afro-Latinos who can fit, right, who are racially black, who are Latinos, right, kind of come in and kind of mess up the ways that we think about it in U.S. media culture where blackness has to be African-American and Latinidad has to be foreign. If you bring in an Afro-Latino here who has Latin American or Caribbean ties, but isn't this, that probably throws off our understanding of even what's American, right? Because within an American frame of thought, we think blackness this way and we think of Latino this way, and Afro-Latinos come in and they would, it would make things very complicated, right? So that's one thing that we can think about. And it's important to understand also, right, what is behind this idea of Latinidad, right? This idea that even the whole immigrant movement does not look black. They don't talk about Afro-Latinos who are undocumented in immigration reform and conversations about DACA. That's not at the forefront, right? That's not even part of the image, right? Also, when we think about people who migrate, right, from Latin America and the Spanish-speaking Caribbean to the United States, we have to understand that the ways that, na that national identities are formed in Latin America, at the foundation of those identities, we have very what I like to call very anti-black foundations of those identities that are framed um, through some of the most popular intellectuals, right, at the turn of the of the 20th century, right? We have Vasconcelos, Martí in Cuba, we have Sarmiento in Argentina, we have Gilberto Freire in Brazil, right? And these kinds of intellectuals and philosophers have really um, contributed to the project of nation building in Latin America to the point that even in Latin America, you do not see black bodies on TV. And when you do, you see them in these very stereotypical ways of they play a slave or they play a maid, right? Very similar ways that even stereotypical um, black roles are played in the United States. 
States, you see that in Latin America as well, right? And in Latin America, you have very similar kind of ideas of, oh, well, we're all Brazilian and we're all Cuban. There's no race here. Like, we don't have a race problem, right? But if you read these, you could, can join my class at any moment. We've been reading these. Um, to actually deconstruct how can we think about national identities in Latin America, but also how do we think about even African American as a national identity within the United States that does not include right, Afro-Latinos. And here, we also don't talk about black Latinos. right? So it's again, where do they go? right? Where do they fall? And also, what would it mean to allow these narratives to exist? What would it mean? Yes? Well, what I was thinking is like you have these very, uh, like two identities in the frame of the US, uh, the USA, and then each identity has their own distinct issues that you associate with each identity. So when you start like mixing them, not only do you have to deal with the problem at hand, but you have to add that extra layer of blackness or whatever, and that just makes it so much more complicated. Complicated. And they don't want to deal with it. Yeah. Or even, right, going back to some of the, um, narratives that we were looking at is this idea of almost not being legible, right? Not being how you're supposed to. In the back? Yeah, I think that, I think most common people are not as educated on the topic. So it's easier to try to group people into a certain area to make it, you know, kind of universal to understand rather than trying to actually understand each individual category. Right. What else? But what would it mean to allow these narratives to exist? Yes, over here. It basically means you have to deconstruct race, I would say. And I think race is like a really weird way of categorizing because you're like, oh, you're black, you're white, you're yellow or Chinese. But then they're like, oh, you're Jew, but Russians are white, but they're on the continent of Asia, so they're not Asian. So it's like the way we define it is like that's, that's not correct. And when you say like, oh, you're black, like now you have to include the Christian white Americans that were brought over here and like have lived here for centuries, also including the black Muslims in Africa and African black people and the Africans that live in South, uh, um, South Africa that could be white if they're like descended, but like have lived there forever because African <laughs> means you are from the continent of Africa. So right, but even even the continent of Africa is, is so, pretty is diverse. Right, and, like right. light and dark skinned mm -hmm. or white maybe even like cold. I mean like it's, it gets to be very confusing. Like, Right, it could be confusing, especially if we do it around along regional, right, these kind of regional geographical lines. It could also get a little confusing with that. I think also going back to here, right, one of the things that we need to highlight also is this idea of what does it mean to be part of the African diaspora, right? If you are, right, a descendant of slaves who were brought to the Americas, right, and you are thinking about blackness Afro-diasporically, that means you're thinking about blackness way beyond just this, right? You are thinking about Nigerian Americans or Nigerians. You are thinking about black Dominicans. You are thinking about Afro-Cubans. You are thinking about, right, it, both of these kind of identities, right, the ways that they're thought of here in the U.S. have to become Afro-diasporically engaged, right? So here we have to think about blackness Afro-diasporically, but we also need to highlight the Afro-diasporic element within Latinidad. That's not saying that all Latinos are black, but that is recognizing that there are black Latinos, right? And not invisibilizing or getting rid of the history, right, of black slaves brought to the Americas, particularly Latin America, Central America, and the Caribbean, right? So if we talk about, well, what would it mean to allow these narratives to exist? We have to think about well, if we allow these narratives to exist, it means that these, one, there has to be that kind of representation of the stories in the media. Two, that also means that Afro-Latinos need to continue to tell their stories. And three, that also means that Afro-Latinos do not need to be wondering, right, or as uh, one of the guys said, trying to act like what could be legible, right, what you're supposed to, right? So this idea of legibility do I really need to be legible for anyone, right? Or do we need to change, right, the discourse and actually deconstruct the discourse of race and particularly blackness, not just in terms of the United States, but also in terms of how we think about Latinidad. So um, to kind of start wrapping up a little bit and kind of switching gears, because we're going to be switching gears, um, this is one person who I think is doing it. I hope some of you recognize her. You know? <laughs> uh, and I just, this was supposed to play when the, when the, uh, right, this was supposed to play when the slide came on. Okay, great. 
<laughs> so Cardi B is one of the people that I actually write about in my manuscript um, as someone who I've been following for a while before Bodak Yellow even became a thing and probably before a lot of people kind of knew more about Cardi B. Um, and one of the things that I argue is actually that when we look at Cardi B, um, a little, not so much lately, I would say, but when we look at Cardi B, she is definitely not so caught up in being legible. Right? Some people don't even know that she's Dominican and Trinidadian. Some people do. Right? Some people, when they find out, they're like, oh, I thought she was black. Like, she's like, yes, I am black, but I'm Dominican and I'm Trinidadian. Right? Um, so I have, want to share a little bit of, a little bit about that particular argument with you all. And then we're going to bring it back to this more interactive part of the workshop. Okay? So. Cardi B, for me, is a new age Afro-Latina feminist that predominantly inhabits the cyberspace in order to transform herself into various subjectivities. The trans space of the cyber world allows her to be at multiple locations at once, to ebb and flow out of diasporas, race, gender, sexuality. She taps into a way of creating knowledge that is by her and for women that come from similar class, gender, and racial backgrounds. Cardi B also embodies a kind of paradoxical feminism in which she recognizes the capital her body possesses and how to use it to gain more access to more. Cardi B, whose real name is Bocalis Almansar, is 23 three years old, well actually now she's 24, 24 years old and was born and raised in the Bronx, New York to a Dominican father and a Trinidadian mother. She spent much of her time growing up between the Dominican neighborhoods of Washington Heights in Manhattan and High Bridge in the Bronx. While no one has yet taken it up upon themselves to also engage with Cardi B on a scholarly level, I do so because, again, I consider Cardi a contemporary Afro-Latina knowledge producer from below that embodies and theorizes from the flesh through the transformation the viewer sees right before their, their very own eyes where she becomes legible and illegible. However, as mundane as she may be considered, Shane Vogel reminds us that, and I quote, it is in the sphere of the, of the mundane that theorists such as Henry Lafabra, Michel de Setour, and Robin D.G. Kelly locate the re resistances and revolutionary practices that are a precondition for happiness and that offer material for imagining a better world, end quote. As a former exotic dancer or stripper, Cardi embodies paradoxical feminism in sharing her own story on how it empowered her and saved her life. In an interview, in an interview with Vlad TV, she talks about her own experience in being in, a, in an abusive relationship at a young age. And she says, um, and I'm literally going to quote her, and I quote, these little young girls, they so quick to move with their boyfriends, and it's like once you do, you gotta deal with cooking for them every day, doing things right for them every day. You might deal with getting your ass beat every day. That's the shit that is like, yup. End quote. When asked if anyone ever tried to pull her out of that situation, she responds no, and explains that she got out by, and I quote, stripping, getting my own money, and leaving. How was I going to leave if I only made $200 a week? Stripping saved my life. End quote. Cardi is a real life evidence that respectability politics will not always save you from oppressive situations. Cardi is hyper aware of the politics of her own black body, yet seeks to critique the paradoxes and problematizations of uplift politics. Epistemology and even black epistemology, and epistemology is a big word for knowledge production, would not consider Cardi a knowledge producer because of her class status, her articulations, and the essentialisms that render Afro-Latinas invisible. Indirectly, Cardi seems to be aware of this, at least in the mainstream sense, when she states in an interview conducted by Fader magazine, and I quote, and she says, a lot of people think I'm just a dumbass, like ho-ass bitch, because I can't talk English properly. And it's just like, yo, if I was dumb, I would not be in the position that I'm in, end quote. <laughs> Cardi B was brought on to the sixth season of Love and Hip Hop New York as a minor personality. However, Cardi used her talents of being quotable and her strong persona by getting ahead of the showbiz game and capturing the audience immediately. Cardi's performance on the show and on her Instagram challenges her interlocutors and herself as she performs herself before the camera. What is most capturing about Cardi B is the way that her Latinidad and her blackness are never separated or even discussed. Instead, Cardi expresses her Afro 
Latinidad in everyday ways, as Vogel posits, he says, and I quote, the everyday refers to the mundane routines, habits, gestures, practices, procedures, relationships, speech acts, and performances by which unremarkable subjects negotiate the modern disciplinary organization of society through lived time and space, end quote. However, although the everyday can become habitus, Cardi undoes her expected performance continuously, right? And if you follow Cardi B on Instagram as much as I do, right, every week you end up at her grandmother's house in Washington Heights, you go down the street to get some Chinese food, right? These are very much everyday things. She embodies her Afro-Latinidad without explanations or translations. Although many viewers know about Cardi B Cardi's Dominican heritage, she does not talk about it all the time, even though lately she's been doing more of that. She doesn't wave Dominican flags, even though she's been doing that more of lately, or speak Spanish on the screen, which she doesn't do very much of. In other words, Cardi does not seem to feel the need to play up her Dominicanness to be considered Latina or legible as Latina. Instead, Cardi seems to show just who she is by enjoying her time, getting her nails and hair done, performing songs from her first album, second album, and now Bodak Yellow while on tour, or introducing her friends to the Dominican restaurant in Washington Heights named La Casa del Mofongo, or as she likes to call it, Mofongo House. Hence, it came by surprise to many of her followers on Instagram when she posted a video of her singing along to a Spanish merengue song. Cardi sings along to La Insuperable Cero Gogas. And you may or may not seen this video because it's pretty old. Bitch was translated for you. I do not care what nobody say about me. That's my schmoop. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, Cardi breaks with the presumed habitus and throws her viewers a curveball or an unexpected moment. She posts a video of her singing a song that is about having other women who hate on you or envy you for what you have and what you and your body can do. Cardi's motion to reveal this part of her singing in Spanish breaks away from putting her in an African-American trope of blackness. She creates a rupture from being boxed into Latinidad or African-American blackness. This video on her Instagram is a moment of rupture that has us catch her in the act of what I call transformation, T-R-A-N-C-E, in which she creates a slippery subjectivity that can only be read and translated by a few. To put it bluntly, you either know or you do not know. And this is the trans subjectivity that Afro-Latinidad offers. In approaching this lack of translatability, I agree with Diana Taylor when she suggests, and I quote, she says, I propose that we proceed from that premise that we do not understand each other and to recognize that each effort in that direction needs to work against notions of easy access, decipherability, and translatability, end quote. In other words, we must acknowledge the complexities and depth that exists within discourses of blackness. If we attempt to capture or essentialize blackness, or more specifically, Afro-Latina womanhood, we fail to acknowledge it in the first place. As a mainstream and reality TV celebrity, Cardi does not separate herself from her identity. She is a moving body, a transforming body, but also engages the viewer in the spirit and trance of what we now call black girl magic. In some ways, Cardi is a bruja who enchants you with her good looks, her stylish ways, her humor, and at the same time transforms into multiple subjectivities all in one frame. She is, as Josefina Baez would say, a levente, continuously moving, transforming, becoming in ways that make her subjectivity and embodiment questionable for many followers. She is transforming Afro-Latina feminist epistemologies right before our very own eyes. In particular, Afro-Latina women's experiences have been left out of the traditional canon of Black and Latina or Chicana feminist theory. Black feminist theory lacks a transnational context and, on, and, and an Afro-diasporic approach that acknowledges the multiplicities of Blackness. Furthermore, Latina and Chicana feminist theory maintains Blackness parenthetical and invisible in favor of a Latinidad that is primarily mestiza. If we are to move these fields forward into the future, 
Afro-Latinos must take a place at the table and be part of the dialogue. In fact, we are the guests at the table whose name nobody knows and whose life nobody understands, whose embodiment is always in question. Our black bodies and our black lives matter too. So as we see with Cardi B, right, this idea of legibility, but also what I argue is, seems to be this Afro-Latina feminism from below, right? This is kind of what it would mean also what, to, to answer the question in one answer, right? There are many answers, but one answer to the question, what would it mean to allow these narratives to exist, right? So back to the interactive part, <laughs> oh fun. Um, so what would it mean to write from that place of illegibility, erasure, invisibility, or hypervisibility, right? Everyone in this room, right, there's only so way, such a way that I can see you and read you, right? And that's the same way that we walk through the streets and people see us in certain ways or know only certain things about us. But there are parts of our identity and how we identify ourselves that are either illegible, invisible, or erased, right? Or even hypervisible to the point that it still becomes misunderstood, right? So I want us to kind of do a little bit of a writing workshop, fun, <laughs> more like a spoken word writing workshop, because I, I do spoken word, right? So we're going to do it, and we're going to do what I call writing with Cardi B, right? <laughs> so this kind of helps you, gives you a bit of a prompt. So these are some of the quotes you can use to answer the question, right? You're not answering the question, you're just writing from your particular positionality, right? You're writing from that part of your identity that is either illegible, erased, invisible, or hypervisible, right? And here's some quotes to get you, to kind of get you, get the ball rolling and get you started. And these are some lyrics and some from uh, a few interviews. So the first one here, I don't want to choose, is from Bodak Yellow lyrics. So you can start with I don't want to choose. We also have you don't understand, if you don't understand it, get a to a person, a person to translate it for you, <laughs> even though clearly that's not what she says in the video. You, you can use, you can express yourself however you see fit. And they told me no, that they didn't really want to work with me. And this is a quote that she says in an interview recently, a couple months ago, um, when, she, when they're asking her about fashion people wanting to work with her, different designs and designers, and at first they did not want to work with her. And this is what she says, they told me no, that they didn't really want to work with me. Right, and I think this is something that we hear a lot with relating to those parts of our identities that are either illegible or erased of like, oh, they told me no, that they didn't really want to work with me. They told me no, that they didn't really understand me, that they didn't really know me, right? So here is three quotes. Feel free to use all three. You can use one to get you started and insert. Feel free to use this however you'd like. We're gonna be writing with Cardi B. I'm going to be writing too, so we're gonna take about, let's say, let's see, 331. I'm gonna say five minutes, very short. This is not gonna be long. Five minutes, get some paper, some pen, and we're going to write a piece of ourselves from those parts of our identities that are illegible, erased, invisible, or hyper-visible. Five minutes. 